So it's been a really rough couple of days for Jesus when the curtain opens on our story, filled with roadblocks and unexpected frustrations. He was just, you know, trying to cross Lake Galilee, and this storm comes up, and his disciples are freaking out. He has to calm the storm and then rebuke them for their lack of faith. And after he calms down from that, they uh, they come to shore, and he's immediately met by the Pharisee demoniac, who's shouting his name and trying to reveal his messianic secret. And so he drives the legion of demons out of this guy, and then himself is driven out by the townspeople. And so now he finds himself crossing the lake again, going back where he came from. Uh, so I don't know exactly what he's feeling here, but I can imagine that he keenly felt the sting of rejection and the frustration of his dismissal and just the exhaustion of these unceasing demands that people are placing on him. And I feel like the lake was, in a way, his only respite, a quiet place in the midst of chaos and people clamoring for his attention. Because it doesn't end there either. By the time the boat reaches land, a crowd has already gathered there. And as he steps out of the boat, there falling at his feet is Jairus, the synagogue ruler, pleading with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and touch her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus goes with him. But as they make their way through the crowd, Jairus turns and sees that Jesus has stopped. And he's looking around him while a thin woman hangs back at the edge of the crowd. Jairus opens his mouth to speak to remind Jesus of the urgency of his mission. But Jesus speaks first. Who touched me? She had been sick as long as Jairus' daughter had been alive. Twelve years of diagnoses and attempted remedies. Twelve years of uncleanness and isolation. Twelve years of daring to hope, only to be left disappointed, penniless, and alone again, the bleeding growing steadily worse. Jesus was her last chance, and suddenly the one she knew she'd been waiting for. And so she found herself pushing through the crowd as he passed. If I could just touch his cloak. His back was to her, and she pushed her way to the edge of the crowd and reached out. And her fingers closed around a handful of fabric, and her body's response was immediate. She felt it, and she knew. One touch had done what none of the doctors had been able to do. She was healed. There would be no more suffering. But as she tries to shrink away and disappear into the crowd, she's arrested by Jesus' question, who touched me? And I can imagine the momentary relief that she probably felt when Jesus' disciples answered him incredulously, who touched you? Like, everybody, you're in the middle of a huge crowd. What do you mean, who touched you? Maybe he would agree. Maybe he would shrug and be on his way. Maybe he wouldn't notice her at all. But Jesus continues to scan the crowd ignoring his disciples. Who touched me? He asks again, but there's not any accusation or anger in his voice. In fact, it sounds strangely like an invitation. The noise of the crowd, the puzzlement of the disciples, the impatience of Jairus, all of it fades away into the background, and all she can hear is her heart thumping in her chest. This invitation is only for one. Jesus is calling her. She steps forward, and although all eyes are fixed on her, the only ones she sees are those of her Savior. And she falls at his feet, hopeful, yet afraid, embarrassed, yet amazed, and gloriously whole. And in a torrent of words, she tells the whole story of Jesus, not just about the touch, not just about the healing. She tells him everything, all of the pain, all of the brokenness. She tells him of all the rejection and loneliness of the past 12 years. But it doesn't matter that everyone is watching. It doesn't matter what they think, because Jesus listens. He waits. And it's like a, like a shaken snow globe has settled around the central figures, leaving a sense of deep stillness. Time has stopped for Jesus, too. And all that matters is this moment, this story, this woman. She finishes her confession and waits for him to speak. When he does, it's almost like the sound of rain on a tin roof or a fire crackling in the hearth to one who's been away from home for far too long. Daughter, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. But the world's brokenness always seems to invade our perfect still moments in the presence of Jesus. 
And this time, when Jesus had barely finished speaking, the sacred was shattered by the abrupt arrival of Jairus' messenger, the abrasiveness of his news. Your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher. But hasn't Jesus made it clear by now that he isn't bothered by interruptions? Don't be afraid, he tells Jairus. Just believe. And the woman he called daughter stands as watches as the man who changed her life forever walks away. But the story doesn't end here. Jesus has another daughter to save. He enters her house where mourners were already wailing. He enters her room where her body is lying motionless on her bed. And as Jairus watches in amazement, Jesus reaches out and grasps the cold hand of a little dead girl and says, get up. And when the Lord of the universe commands life, life answers. Two people came to Jesus that day looking for healing. And that day, two daughters were given new life. This story paints an incredible portrait of what happens when God interacts with humanity because it doesn't always work out perfectly. To us, it may seem like the timing isn't right. It's awkward and it's messy. Stories are supposed to flow and be eloquent and interruptions are jarring and disconcerting. For my last sermon evaluation, Dr. Durham told me that my story didn't flow quite as well as he would like to see next time, but if he were uh, evaluating Mark, he would have to give him at least a B for this one. <laughs> Because typically, we put interruptions in the awkward category and brush them aside to get to the main point. But what's interesting here is that the chiastic structure of this story points us to the middle, actually points us to the interruption. The seeming inconvenience becomes the focal point of the story, just as it was the focal point of Jesus' attention. Henry Nowen writes of a meaningful conversation that he had with a Notre Dame professor, in which the professor mused, my whole life I've been complaining that my work was constantly interrupted, until I realized that my interruptions were my work. And I venture to say that perhaps Jesus saw this the same way. That interruptions didn't distract from his ministry because they were his ministry. Because we are his ministry. And I remember the night, and I was probably around six or seven, when it first occurred to me that in a world so full of people, there's bound to be sometimes when there's more than one person praying at the same time, and maybe even in a different language. And how does God listen to all of that at the same time, I wonder? Does he get distracted by interruptions? And to be honest, that question has never truly gone away from me. When we're in our darkest moments of pain, I think that at some level it still surfaces for all of us. Does God see my tears? Can God hear me right now? Does one person's pain even matter when there is so much suffering in the world? And I've often felt like the line in the 10th Avenue North song, like just one tear in the driving rain, one voice in a sea of pain. But to Jesus, no interruption is an inconvenience. Every time someone reaches out for his cloak, he will look for them until they are found, listen until their story is told, and love them with a love that claims them and declares them valuable. To Jesus, every interruption is a son or daughter. He wants you to encounter him, so seek him out. Whether it's doubt you've been afraid to acknowledge, pain you don't know how to express, or even just the childish excitement of a spring day that you want to share with a friend. Your faith to reach out is the interruption that Jesus is waiting for. So reach out and interrupt boldly. No matter when you come, no matter what your story, he claims you as his own. Son, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace.